Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Great song, guys. Praise the Lord. And we do. Every hour, every minute of every hour, every second of every minute. Praise the Lord. Kind of running 100 miles an hour today without... Been one of those days, got a little long-winded over there, so... I have a tendency to do that occasionally, like every Sunday. <laughs> but it's good to see you today. David made it back from Libya. We're glad you got in, sir. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't know why he goes over there. Not like they put a gun in his hand to go or something. But anyways, it's good to see you today. We just had a great leadership dinner the other night, uh, Friday night here at the church, where we kind of went over some things that were going on in the ministry. And we really looked at and saw how the Lord was really blessing this particular area and just a whole fresh breath of uh, population. Houses are going up where, everywhere you turn. New subdivisions, Grand Parkway's bringing in a lot of things, Exxon's bringing in thousands of homes, and so we've just a new opportunity before us to reach more people than we've reached in a long time, so uh, we're refreshed and excited about that, and if you weren't there, you just missed it, so get involved somewhere in the ministry, and you'll be invited, praise the Lord. But it was a great, great time the Lord to share a vision and talk about the, the plans that are ahead of us and what the Lord has before us. A couple of things I do want to rem remind you of is that just a couple of Sundays from now is our 25th anniversary celebration Sunday. Amen? Yes. It's going to be a great, great day in the Lord. You, you'll be hearing a lot more about it from this Sunday on. We have about this Sunday and two or three more, and then we're, then we're right on that September 29th Sunday. So be sure and uh, take notice. What are you doing to me back there? It sounds like I'm breathing in my own ears up here or something. Take me completely out of the monitors and quit messing with the sound. Thank you. <laughs> Fix it and leave it alone. <laughs> Put it back wherever it was last Sunday. But anyway... When we come up this September 29th, this is going to be a tremendous opportunity. Some people just say, oh, we're just going to have a party. No, this is about reaching our community. All right, so the time we're investing in it, the commitment that we're making to it is all about reaching this community. But that will not happen if we don't do what God's called us to do, and that's just be the church by inviting and loving and caring about people. So get it on your list of your, your, your calendar and put it on your Facebook and your Twitter or whatever you do socially. Get the word out. Tell as many people as possible. It's going to be a great day in the Lord for planning for a lot of people. It'll be free food and fellowship and fun. Music galore. Jeff Bimber's going to be here. Both of our bands, both campuses are going to be ministering together as well as doing some stuff. We have stuff on the parking lot. Youth group's going to be doing dramas. There's going to be lots of games and activities. It's going to be an afternoon deal. So just make plans. Get it on your schedule. Get it on your calendar. It's going to be a great, great day in the Lord. It's going to be a blast as well. So you don't want to miss that. Also, I do want to remind you about one other important thing that uh, in the presence of God is our, our marriage retreat. This is the last Sunday. Uh, to get that early bird discount for the marriage retreat. So when you leave today, uh, out in the lobby, there's some brochures uh, uh, over there by one of the TVs in, on the left, I believe. Pick up a brochure, sign the registration. Uh, it, you don't have to pay the whole thing today, just the deposit. So put your deposit in, make sure you're going to be, be a part of that. And even more so, if you have somebody that you're trying to get here and you're not sure they can make the commitment or not, if they're a first-time attender to our marriage retreat, then they still get the early bird discount right, just for being a first-time guest of ours. So be sure and, and use this opportunity. I cannot tell you how many marriages have been blessed, restored, and many saved because of these uh, retreats and these conferences we do. So if you've ever been to one, you know what I'm talking about, and I believe this is going to be one of the best ever. So that's all for the paid commercial announcements. Before you turn the channel, let me move on to the message, all right? The message is a continuation of our messages on apostasy. As we look at this message today, especially, it gets right down to where they, the nitty-gritty. You say, when they all have over these last few weeks. Remember, the book of Jude was written by the brother of Jesus. And he's, he is sharing what, what the Lord has impressed upon his heart. He said, I wanted to write to you about the common salvation, but I felt it necessary. And that word has to do, there was this great impulse that the Holy Spirit moving upon him to write about something else. And he said, I want to write to you about the apostasy, about the falling away from the faith. Now, it says part three on the, on the slide up there, but it's really part five. That's my era. We're in part five of this. And each week we've gone through a couple of verses and we've talked about what the book of Jude and Jude, the brother of Jesus, said would be the, the state of affairs, so to say, in the last days. Now, Second Peter has a lot to say, and First and Second Peter both a lot to say about the end time falling away from the faith. But Jude, man, he doesn't say it is coming. He says it's here. Now, Jesus said that it would be here at a climax, so in the end times, which I believe we're in those days. And one thing that marks the end times is this great uh, departure from the, from the faith, the real commitment 
what it really means to be saved, what it really means to, to believe in God, the Bible says there's going to be a departure from that. Remember, there's not, even though the world says there is, there's not many faiths. There's just one faith. There's many religions. And religion is man's attempt to somehow uh, merit God's favor or reach heaven. You know, or, that's religion. It's, it's all about what you can do. But Christianity is just the, 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 the polar, the extreme, the opposite of that, is what God has done. And what God has accomplished for us so that no man can boast about what he's done. God can be glorified. Jesus can be honored. That God has given us a way of salvation. That he sent his son. He died on the cross. He took our place in judgment. He died our death. He was buried and he rose from the dead, expressing his triumphant victory over death, over demons, over hell, over the grave. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father and he's coming back soon. All right? That's the gospel message. And we, we should be excited about that because these are the days I believe he will be coming soon. As we've walked through these verses, we've seen very clear what apostasy is. It is not people who are really committed to Christ and saved, and then they change their mind or they backslide. All right? It is people who have a, an appearance of salvation. They have an intellectual agreement to Christianity, but they've never made that heart-transforming commitment to Christ that literally changes your life. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Why? Because God does something supernatural in the heart. And that's why Jude started off this book by saying, you're not to worry. It's kind of like, you, you're the preserved, you're the blessed, you know, you, you're the called. You're not an apostate, but the apostates are coming. And they're like, they're like uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, so keep your eyes open. It's a warning. And he closed, opens the book with that security of our, our salvation, and he closes it saying that God's going to present us blameless. So he deals with that issue. So he makes it clear that the apostates are not people who, who knew Christ and somehow lost it. They're people who were pretend believers. Now, the, Jesus warned about that. There's whole parables given over to that in the Gospels about the weeds sowed among the tear. You know how there would be the, uh, the, the wheat represented the, uh, the true believer and the tear represented the false believer. So there's, Jesus said on, in John that there'll be many who stand before me on that last day and will say, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. The apostate is someone who never really knew Jesus, all right? They claimed it, they named it, they might have framed it, but they never really knew Jesus as the Lord and Savior. So let's look at these verses. We already worked our way down last week. We, we dealt with eight and nine and, and portions of this. But he says, in the same manner, these men, talk, talking about the apostates, also by dreaming, defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, thank you, the Lord rebuke you. And by the way, you say, what is all that about? See what happens when you miss church? <laughs> if you really want to know what that's all about, I am sorry, I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> It is online. We have a DVD available. It is online on YouTube. You can just do the BF Church video search for our channel. You'll find it there. If not, there will be there by this afternoon. Right, Richard? All right. Praise the Lord. So he's talking about how these apostates react and how they, how they function and what they do. And you kind of get an insight to, to, the, to the way they're working. But he goes on in verse 10 and he says, These men revile the things by which they do not they don't understand, and the things which they do know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they're destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So what he's doing is kind of giving an illustration of the apostates, and he's done that the last couple of weeks as we've been through this particular series. Remember, what is apostasy? It is an abandonment it is abandonment and rejection to the truth, the only truth, the truth of God's Word, the truth that is found in Scripture, the truth that is in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And the more that we go towards this return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more obvious these apostates will become. And this is what Jude is saying. They have a history. In fact, we dealt with last week as we began this particular portion of the scripture, said there's this detailed description in Jude 8 through 13 of their conduct we talked about last week. Today we're going to talk about their company. 
In the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about their character and their condemnation. And he kind of gives an insight to who these guys are, what they did, how they act, what's their character, and where they're headed in all these things. In the conduct we talked about last week, he said those five things. They, they defile the flesh. By the way, if you're an apostate, it always shows up sooner or later if you're not the real deal in immorality. Not that a Christian can't have an immoral failure, but he won't stay there. The apostate will not only stay there, he'll justify why he's there. He'll rationalize. He'll say stuff like, we're under grace. It's okay. All right? Now, God doesn't mean that anymore. Or that's Old Testament. Whatever it goes. They, they're always looking for an excuse. They despise authorities. In other words, there's an arrogant sin, apostasy is, that ultimately will hold a, a contempt for God. They speak evil of doxos, of glories. And the word there is, is they, they'll blaspheme God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. They speak about things they don't know about, which is pretty common for this crowd. They don't know what they're talking about most of the time. They'll come up and pull Bible verses out of, out of, out of context. But and even the things that they do know about, they're condemned by those very things. But today we want to deal not just with, with the conduct we talked about, but let's talk about their company. And that's what he gets into when he mentions three people here. It's the birds of a feather flock together group. It's, it's, it's the cohorts of the apostates. And he's given us illustrations, like some of those rebellious angels. He's given us illustrations such as, you know, uh, not just the angels, but he's talked about the Sodomites, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's talked about the backsliding Jews in the wilderness. But now he gets a little more detail with, the, with this identification. All right, I'm going to go back, and you're going to have to follow me with this because it's not doing the subtitles, or, or pull it over into PowerPoint right quick, if you don't mind that. But he talks about the, their company, and he identifies these three men. First is Cain. And the second one is Balaam, and the third one is Korah. Now with Cain, remember, you see in him as an apostate. If anybody knew the truth, Cain and Abel knew it. Their mom and dad were Adam and Eve, all right? You can't get any closer to the beginning than that. Wouldn't you agree? They should know the truth. But Cain, in his, in his ignorance and arrogance, he chooses his own way. Then there's Balaam, says they run headlong after Balaam. He represents the greed and the seduct seductive, immoral nature of the, of, of the apostates. And then there's Korah, who if you ever follow the Old Testament story of the children of, the, of, of Israel in the wilderness, you see how Korah led the people in an open rebellion against God. But let's just look at the process. In verse 11 it says, They go and they rush and they perish. Where do they go? He says, the way of Cain, the era of Balaam, and they perished like Korah. The way of Cain, the era of Balaam, and they perished like, uh, like, uh, like Korah. Now, let's look at each one of these. First of all, you've got Cain, and with Cain you see an absolute rejection of the truth. All right? He knows what he's supposed to do, but he doesn't do it. He rejects the true way. And with Balaam, you know, here's a guy who knows what the truth is about God's people. God has spoken it clearly to him, but he rejects the truth as well. Cain rejects the way, Balaam rejects the truth, and Korah, in his rebellion, he rejects the life that God has. What is and who is, should I say, is, is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Now, if you really want to start a riot, I think I said this last week at work or at school, just get up and say that. Yeah. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can get to heaven but by Jesus. How can you be so arrogant? How can you be so narrow-minded? How can you be so foolish? How can you be so judgmental? How can you be so intolerant? That's the word of the day, but this is, the, again, the sign of the apostate. So he identifies these three guys in, in, in this regard, and I'm trying again. There we go. So say include, please, or embed there, and then fix it. All right. That's the last chance I'm going to give it. But he goes the way of Cain. Now, what is the way of Cain? Now, you remember with Cain, uh, the son of Adam and Eve, he had a brother, he ended up killing his brother. They both presented gifts. Remember that? And Abel brings to the Lord an acceptable and a pleasing offering, and that acceptable, pleasing offering was a blood sacrifice, an animal sacrifice. Uh, Cain brings a grain offering, all right? Now, there's some, some uh, theological differences over this. Even some of the early church fathers were debating over this. Was the issue because one brought a grain offering and one brought a blood offering? Uh, or was the issue that one didn't bring the first fruits of his offerings? Because when you go through the Old Testament offerings, they're grain offerings and they're acceptable to the Lord. And the Lord had prescribed grain offerings and, and those kind of first fruits. Deal. I really believe that both are accurate. 
in, 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 in what they're saying. One is, obviously, right after Adam and Eve, the blood sacrifice, the blood offering was a clear understanding that man has fallen in his sin. He's rebelled against God. We blew it. And the only way for our sins to be atoned for is death. The wages of sin is death. And until the true lamb comes, we present a lamb. Now, when you look at some of this over Cain and the issue of the grain offering, the bottom line is really described well in Hebrews chapter 11 when it says that Abel presented a more pleasing offering to the Lord. Why? Because he did it by faith. He looked to the Father. He wasn't doing something just to be religious. He wasn't just going through the motions. He wasn't just pretend, pretending, you know, to kind of, or, or, or seeking to be genuine. He was just pretending in his religious life. It wasn't real for him. So he just did what he wanted to do. He just presented what he wanted to present. And I believe, even though it was a grain offering, even if it wasn't acceptable, it wasn't first fruits because it wasn't pleasing to the Lord. The Bible says there's only one way that any of us can be pleasing to God. And the way that we please God is by faith. We, it's the only way. And faith in what? Faith in anything? No. Faith in Christ. Faith in Him. Faith in His Word. Faith in His ways. It's, it, and the way of Cain is just the opposite. Cain is a religious guy, but he's bound by natural understanding, and he's bound by his own sin, and it, the root of his sin, that, that hatred and that envy, all that, it, it, it's, it's a perfect character of the apostates who are only interested in doing what they want to do and the way that they want to do it. He believed in God. He's out there. Might have some kind of religion in his life, but he wanted to do it the way he wanted to do it. Cain, if he lived today, would write a country song that's entitled something like this. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. I know that was a country song for you country folks. But that's, a, that's, that's, that's Cainism. That's Cainianity, whatever you want to call it, all right? That's the, that's the mindset and that's the way and that's the role of Cain. I'm just going to do this the way I want to do it. Oh yeah, there's a God out there. How many... Pop stars and TV stars, have you heard say that same thing? I mean, it's almost gotten uncountable anymore. Oh, well, you know, I, 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 I believe the Bible, but I kind of work it out my own way, and I, I've kind of mixed this with that, and I just kind of believe a little bit of everything, and, and it, that's just the way of Cain. When God has so clearly spoken unto us, and God has so clearly given unto us the Word of God, God has so clearly laid out for us His way, His truth, and His life, but yet we don't want to do that because of our sinful way and our sinful nature, so we choose instead to have some kind of little uh, religious experience. It is nothing, in simplicity, it is nothing but this. It is just self-righteousness. I'm going to do it my way. Might be, I'll try to embrace some things having to do that are, that are ethical. I might do some things that are, uh, are, uh, are, are religious. I might go to church. I might, you know, uh, sing in the choir. I, I'll, I'll be a part of the congregation. But hey, the way of Cain is the way of pride. It's the way of religion without faith. It's the way of, of going around God's established plan of righteousness and rejecting the righteousness that comes only one way. And the Bible says it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. I choose my will, my way, my mindset over this way of Cain. I reject God and do what I want to. And what's he end up doing? He ends up killing his brother. But what we say last week, we said that the apostate defiles the flesh. And that's exactly what he does in this regard. He goes his own way and he does his own thing. And uh, failure, nothing but failure. So the next thing here, he says they go... The way of Cain, and by the way, I don't, it's like a process. They go, they run, they perish. All right? They go, they run, they perish. They just, there's just no hope for them. They start heading that direction, and that's the problem with heading the wrong direction. Pretty soon, it's a downhill deal. <laughs> you begin to run that way, and begin you, it all leads to one place. There's a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death and destruction. So here's Cain. He rejects the heavenly standard. Basically, he does reject the blood and the sacrifice. The heir of Balaam, this is the only guy in history that had his jackass tell him off. <laughs> oh, mama, it's in the Bible. <laughs> Maybe you're familiar with the story. I won't go there, but I'll just say this. Balak, the king of the Moabites and the Gentile nations, the children of Israel on their way through the wilderness and these kingdoms are battling against them and they're 
you know, the, there's, there's some wars that take place against the Amalekites and others. Well, the king, King Balak, he said, there's got to be an easier way to do this. And so he went to a prophet and tried to hire him by the name of Balaam. Offered him money several occasions. Balaam kept turning him down and turning him down. But finally, Balaam came up with a way that he could, he could defile the people of God and still have his own way. Still do his own thing and make some money. Because Balak was offering big time cash. All right. We just want to defeat the people of God. What's the way that we can do it? Can you speak a curse against them? You're a prophet. What can we do here? Balaam represents the guy who uh, is the prophet for hire. He's the preacher who is open to the highest bidder. The bottom line of what happened there, ultimately when God wouldn't curse through Balaam, he only kept telling them that God's going to bless them. He devised a plan where he would get the Moabite women to seduce the children of Israel and the men of the children of Israel to commit a trespass and do what God had told them not to do. God had told them, you're going through these lands, especially when you get into Canaan, do not, do not intermarry with these pagan cultures. They'll lead you astray. They represented the world, all right? And ultimately, when they got involved with the Moabite women, they began to worship their gods and death reigned, judgment came, and there were problems. But here's the way that Balaam, here was his approach to it all. He tells the Moabite women, you go do this, you know. These guys are suckers for good-looking women. So you go, you, you go do your thing, and, and then he tells the children of Israel, hey, don't worry about it, it's okay. I know what God said, but you're God's children. You're a covenant people. And as a covenant people, God's not going to, judge you. He's, he's got, God's a God of love. And God's your, your covenant, you know, you, 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 you got this relationship, so don't worry about it. What did Jude 4 say? It says, they turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, which is a word for immorality. In other words, it's that, here's, here's the New Testament, modern day version of that. It's all right to be a homosexual. It's all right to have premarital sex. It's all right to be involved in all these ways. You're a Christian. God loves you. Jesus died for your sins, and you're under grace. So since you're under grace, all things are lawful for you. That's the doctrine or the era of Balaam. It's not true. Even as a child of God, if I sin, I will be chastened. Some of you keep wondering why things don't work out and won't work out. If you're a child of God, they never will if you're in sin like that. Now, if you're not chasing for it, then you're not saved. Now, that's not my word. That's the word from the book of Hebrews chapter 12. If you're without, if you're without chastening and you sin and God doesn't chasten you, he says, then you're not really a child of God. You're illegitimate. You're just religious. All right? You're just religious. But how, how can I know I'm really a child of God and not an apostate? I can't get away with anything. <laughs> Trust me, I've tried, you've tried to get away with stuff. You know, I don't know about you, God keeps me on a short leash. How about you? About the time I start going this way, you used to have a dog, never would respond to a leash. You ever have one like that? <laughs> You're choking him half the time. That's the way I feel sometimes. I start going out this way, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes, Lord. Praise God for that. How many times has God rescued you before you ever got in dirty, deep pit? It's always been the grace of God. I know what you're saying back there. I appreciate your work, but if I don't take it, don't worry about it, all right? <laughs> the era of Balaam. You're under grace. You're God's people. It's no big deal. But it is a big deal. And if you are the child of God, if you are in a covenant relationship with Jesus, you're in trouble. But Balaam, his deal was, you know, uh, it, it was, it ultimately was his undoing, but his deal was, is all about payday. And that's why we have a lot of preachers filling pulpits and on the airwaves today. That's the way it is with them. It's all about the payday. What can I get out of this? How much can I make off this? How much can, you know, it's it shear the sheep for the prophet. And there's a lot of warnings in the scripture about that. New Testament, Old Testament about being that kind of person. In fact, it's the apostate who's only interested in his wallet. I, I'm always amazed when you have these exposés and covering some of these preachers who have multiple homes and cars and boats and yachts and jets. And, I mean, that's, that's ungodly. It's just ungodly. You say, you're just jealous. Listen, I got a bigger payday coming. Amen. Amen. I have a bigger payday coming. Uh, don't you do too, amen? We all have a bigger payday coming. 
But there are, there are people, the apostate, he says, is the person who's looking for the payday now. They want the prominence now. It may not be in money. It could be the celebrity status. That's about what everybody's looking for these days. Popularity, fame, applause, position, title. There's a lot of different things which put a, a man or woman in the way of Balaam and the era of Balaam. But Jude says it's the era of Balaam. Preaching what's acceptable, preaching what people want to hear, saying what's going to tickle the ear. That's the doctrine of Balaam. Draw the crowd, that's what's important. Bigger crowd, bigger paycheck. And when you compromise for that basis, you fall into the whole idea of the doctrine of Balaam. What happened to Balaam? Well, the Bible says God judged Balaam along with others. God judged them. And Numbers 31, 8 says, And they slew the king of Midian. This is after God says, This, this stuff of Moabite women, is, is, we're stopping it. They slew the king of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. Why did they do that? Numbers 31, 16 says, Because these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam, to the preaching of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. The Apostle Peter said, In the last days, men will make merchandise of your souls. In fact, I, I, you know, I appreciate publishing and Christian books and stuff, but I want you to know there is a market in the Christian industry that's worth billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. And we somehow thought that, you know, what's the most important thing in the culture that we're living in is fame and fortune. That is the doctrine, and that is the era of Balaam. But also says, they perish at the gainsayings of, of, of Korah. Now, the word gainsaying, it, it, it may not use that particular word. It's the word in the Greek which has to do against the word, antilogia, is it, the way we'd say it in the English language. It's alogia, without the word. Of, they, re, they, they contradict the word of God. They do what they want. They say, well, I know what the Bible says, but I'm going to do what I'm going to do. There was a guy in the, in, the, in, the, in the children of Israel as they made their journeys across the wilderness by the name of Korah. I believe he was the cousin of Moses. And as you looked at him, he was a Levite, but he had been rejected from being, you know, uh, uh, from being a priest. And God had set up Moses over the children of Israel as basically their spokesman and their mediator. But what Korah says, we don't need Moses. We don't need a mediator. The whole, in fact, number 16 says, the whole congregation, the whole entire congregation of Israel is, is holy. So we don't need mediators. Now, eventually what happened was that God said, okay, let me, let me tell you something core here. The earth swallowed up, opened up and swallowed him and, and a bunch of his followers. But the idea that the, that, the, that the apostate propagates is the same idea that Korah propagated is that we don't need a mediator. We don't need a go-between. Now, God had raised up Moses as the only mediator in that time during that journey in the wilderness between him. He spoke to God on behalf of the people. God spoke to him on behalf of himself to the people, and he was God's go-between. Now, God has told us that Moses was just a type of mediator. Jesus is the ultimate mediator. In fact, Jesus is called our high priest, all right? So the apostate will tell you, you don't really need a mediator. There's more than one mediator if you do. It's the mediator of my choosing. Listen, anybody that tells you there's another way to God the Father other than Jesus is an apostate and a liar. All right? And by the way, some of these people come in clothing of Christianity. Some of them call themselves Christians, but also go by the name of Latter-day Saints. Some of them call themselves Jehovah Witness. There's no need for mediators. Some of them call themselves Catholics. They don't believe there's only a mediator. They believe there's a co-redeemer and a co-mediator. There are saints that can also mediate on your behalf. Now, I know that's not popular. I see some of you grimacing. It'll be okay. We're just talking about the truth here. All right? The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Amen. That's what it boils down to. I don't apologize for the truth. I tell you, we just need to get back to having some guts again and some boldness in the church today. Instead of going around saying, I don't want to offend you, but Jesus loves you. <laughs> Is it all right if I give you a gospel track? <laughs> oh, you don't want, oh, so sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. I know I'm being judgmental. On and on it goes. This is, this is, this is core. We don't need anybody. 
But I want you to know the Bible says we need a high priest and his name is Jesus and he is our high priest now. Yeah. Scripture makes it very, 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 very clear. And what is it? No man comes to the Father but by Jesus. So you can take away your little medallions, melt them down and sell them for something of value. Come on. Oh, that one didn't go well, did it? <laughs> Why? Because I'm not praying to the saints saying the same mess I am. I'm praying to the one who handled it, who conquered it, who's the victor and the Lord and the King, and his name is Jesus. That's who we pray to. That's who we go to. The apostate says, oh, no, 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 no. There's many ways to the God. One God, God, Allah, God, Father, God, all these God, Jehovah, God, all these God. They're all the same God. There's only one God. And he said, before me there were none others. After me there's none others. The only true God. But Cora says otherwise. We don't need that. I mean, how, how would you like to say, you know, Brother Joe, let's go meet the president. And so we just get on our little trail and pedal up to the White House, knock on the door. Is Barack home? <laughs> we like to see the president. You're not getting in there. I'm not getting in there. Especially if they've been listening to my phone calls. <laughs> Reading my email. <laughs> hey man, I'm not getting in. Now if I know somebody like the chief of staff, secretary of defense, somebody like that, and I have a relationship, I might get an audience somewhere down the line. But I've got to know somebody. Don't you dare think you're going to parade right into the throne room of God and say, I belong here if you don't know somebody. And that somebody's Jesus. That's the someone we have to know. But not so with Cora. We don't, you know, we don't need that. We just need to do our own thing. We just, you know, we just need to, you know, God loves everybody. The apostate rejects three things. What's he reject? Well, if you follow the line here, he rejects the blood, he rejects the word, and he rejects the mediator. That's what it really boils down to. But that's our culture today. They don't want to tolerate that. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to listen to that. In fact, if you, you, you embrace this in your life and you really believe it in your life. The longer you believe it and the more vocal you become about it, the more you will be persecuted. The more you will be laughed at. In fact, you might do some jail time for promoting hate crimes. You know, they don't believe it. That's where we are in our nation right now today. And we had better wake up and smell the proverbial roses. But we don't do it because, you know, we, we don't back down because we think our feelings. We're just going to keep moving forward. Why? Because we do believe that the blood is the only way, the only sacrifice, the clean, holy, acceptable, only acceptable blood from that holy, clean Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe His Word. We do not reject His Word. We don't say we want our way over His way. We trust His Word. And we don't reject the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you follow these three guys, and it's like where John was talking about. He says, you know, don't love the world. And don't love the things that are in the world. For if any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For it's the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the, and the pride of life. Those three things, lust of the flesh, eyes, and pride of life, they represent these three guys here, don't they? They represent perfectly this whole apostate concept. He said, that's not of the Father. So don't love, because that's where the world is. The world doesn't want to hear about one way, one truth, one hope, one baptism, one faith, one Lord, one resurrection. They don't want to hear that. Until we get broken, until we get humble, and then you'd be surprised how many people will want to hear it. But they'll never hear it if you compromise it. And they'll never hear it if you embrace those kind of mindsets which are constantly being pushed in upon us. You know, I constantly read articles every day, not only from the secular press, but from the Christian press, that you see the influence coming over from the media into the church. One article, I read, it's time to quit railing against homosexuality. You know, we shouldn't be talking about stuff. God's got to love, and we just need to focus on what's important. People, you know, listen. We ought to focus on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and everything that's going to keep you from coming to Him. <laughs> and it's not that we're preaching against something, we're preaching for something. My opposition is to those things that are worldly is because I have a, an embracing and an, I'm not opposed to truth. 
But you can't be embracing truth and not standing for something. If you're going to be a believer, you're going to have standards. And you do not need to apologize for having them. You don't say, I'm so sorry, but this is the way I feel about it. It's always hurt your feelings. I'm so sorry. Don't let the world push you in that box. Be bold. Be alive. Be full of Jesus. Be full. That's what's going to attract people who are desperate and hurting and want life. Apostates are going to be apostates no matter what. <laughs> All right? But there are a lot of people who believe the apostate message. They're coming to the end of themselves and saying there's no life there. Cain rebelled against God's authority, ultimately in salvation. He refused to bring the sacrifice that God wanted. There was no faith in his heart to remind. And the only way we come to God is by faith in Christ Jesus. Cain rejected. Balaam rebelled against God's authority in separation. Holiness is not important. Don't be too religious now. Don't be too religious. That's why I love this study that we're in in our lift groups on the pursuit of holiness. Because we've lost that in the church today, that people are actually pursuing God and His righteousness and His holiness. It'll be a part of our lives. That we're ours, we are uniquely separate. We're not like the world. We're not of this world. We're different people. And we choose to live differently. Korah rebelled against God's authority in serving, denying that Moses was God's appointed leader and authority and attempting to usurp that authority. So I'll just do what I want to do. It's interesting to note that the verbs that, J that Jude uses in this passage, in this verse, and when it says he'd gone the way of Cain, literally you could say it this way in the English language, he traveled on the road of Cain. When he talks about the error of Balaam, he says, and gave themselves over to the error of Balaam. So they're moving that direction, they start yielding in that direction, and it says, and they perished in the rebellion of Korah. The tragedy of apostasy, the tragedy of rejecting the word of God is this element of perishing. In fact, he starts out verse 11 by says, Woe unto them! Now the earth may not swallow them up like it did, like it did Korah, but still the judgment's out there, and we talked about that a couple weeks ago, that's appointed. You choose this lifestyle, all that waits you is, is judgment. You choose Jesus, all that waits you is the glory of heaven, fellowship with the Father, fellowship with the saints. Well, what a terrible thing. I prefer that over judgment. I prefer that over death and hell and misery. In fact, the word woe here is an unusual Greek word. Uh, the very pronunciation of this word in the Greek language is well. Well! Well! Well unto them! And it is, and the wailing there is a word which denoted grief or denunciation. And I really believe in this context it's both. It should grieve us that there are teachers and false prophets, and churches, and people who reject the clarity and the simplicity and the beauty and the truth of holiness and of God's Word and of Jesus and God's authority in our life. But it also should not only grieve us, you know, it's a well of, we don't want to be a part of that. We renounce, denounce that. Those apostates that Jude has identified, he's saying, woe unto them. What about you? Where are you in the whole scheme of things? Are you, are you kind of fall in that camp and say, well, I know what the Bible says. Oh, God loves me. And, you know, uh, but I'm just going to kind of put it together myself. I'm going to kind of come up with my own little system. That's just self-righteousness. The, the, the glorious thing here is that you don't have to put it together yourself. Yeah. Left to yourself, you'll make a mistake every time. You should have discovered that by now. Amen. <laughs> If you haven't discovered that yet, you're, it's going to be a real wake-up call one day, isn't it? The beauty of it, is, and, and, and holiness is, and the beauty of righteousness is, is that it's all provided for us as a gift of grace. I don't have to earn it. You know, I don't have to sacrifice myself. I don't have to put rocks in my shoes every time I walk, do a sin against God and walk around for three days and confess things. Paid for. God in his beautiful mercy paid for my salvation and your salvation. And the truth is, if I want to get to the Father, I've got to come through Jesus Christ. Otherwise, then I fall to the same denunciation of woe. He says, they go the way of Cain. This is why there's woe. This is why there's grief. They go their own system of religion. They run after the heir of Balaam. Preaching for profit, living for self. And they perish at the antologia talk, the rejection of the Savior of Korah. 
Now, it's, it's just the other way for us. What way am I going? Well, there's a way that seems right unto man. We know what the end of it is, the Bible says. Why don't I go the way of truth? Why don't I not go the way of Joe or of Cain, but let's go the way of Jesus, who is the way? And what about what I'm believing? Am I believing what the world's telling me or what some false preacher wants to tell me or, or some guy that just wants to get a little deeper into my wallet wants to tell me? He's going to say nice things to me so I can shovel out some more cash to him, pat me on the back, tell me how sweet I am. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. Okay? Is that where I'm going to go? Is that what it's about? Is that what you want? Or do you want the way of truth? Embrace the way of truth. Then that's Korah. You're going to reject Jesus? Because that, in the bottom line, is what it really gets to be all about, isn't it? I see that clearly when Pilate is standing and Jesus is facing him. And Jesus says, this is the truth. He says, what is truth? He doesn't see the truth that's before him. Because he doesn't want to repent. He doesn't want to give up his life. He doesn't want to give up his will. He doesn't want to give up his sin. He doesn't want to give up his way of living. There's too much at stake. He doesn't realize what's at stake is his very own life. And he just tries to push Jesus off, let somebody else do it. I'm going to wash my hands. I recognize that he's innocent, but you do whatever you want to do. There's a lot of people who fall in that line. I pray that as you hear these messages on apostasy, that your heart is tender enough to say, hey, I don't need a religious lie. I need truth. A lie, religiosity, being a Baptist, a Catholic, a Methodist, none of those things are going to save you. you know? Mormons, Jehovah Witness, there's no denomination or abomination that's going to save you. Only Jesus saves. Run to Christ. Don't say, well, you know, Brother Joe, I was born this and I did that. And my papa was this and grandma, she was, she was a Baptist. And, you know, Uncle Leroy, he was a Methodist. And, you know, my cousin Bobby, he's an Assembly of God preacher. Do you think you're going to get it by osmosis, just hanging around them? No, you're not. You're going to have to make your own choice beyond religion and beyond denomination that goes and says, it's about the Son of God. What am I going to do with Jesus? Because He is God's only way. If you've not done that, what better day than right now, right here in this moment, to just open your heart to God and say, Lord God, I, I don't want to be a part of this woe generation and this woe crowd. I want life. Forgive me, because I have put myself before you, just like these apostates do, and I don't want to be counted with that crowd. I want to know Jesus. I want to know the way, the truth, and the life. I don't want my salvation depending on me sitting down and making a list of what I've done for God. My list is not made up of that. My list is made up of what God's done for me. So I've trusted Him for what He's done. That's where salvation comes in. And if you're a Christian... Jesus said, because this kind of wickedness will abound in the last days. In Matthew 24, he's given that last day sermon on, on prophecy in the end times. He says, because iniquity is going to be abounding everywhere, the love of many will wax cold. And maybe there's been so much of this ungodliness that surrounds us on every side. We've become dead and unmoved and untouched so that we just sit back and we watch the movies and we watch the TV shows that are so filled with godlessness and such immoral lifestyles and promotion of such ungodly ideas. And we just, just be entertained by it and enjoy it and text our friends how wonderful that was tonight. Facebook, did you get that world about, you know, different, you know, ordinary family or whatever. We've got to get our hearts right with God. This is the day where the church needs to be on fire. And the church is made up of people. So really, this is the day when individual people need to get on fire. And if I get on fire, you get on fire, guess what happens? A fire spreads. Amen? A fire will spread. And a fire will spread. And you know what happens also? People like to come watch a fire. Amen? Firefighters hate that. <laughs> Just spectators. Hey, your city sit on a hill. Shine. Be bright. Burn bright. Stand with your heads bowed.